Greetings, everyone. I love my faith. I love my community. But for thousands of years, men in my community truly believe that they are the recipients of God's divine message. They believe that they are better than, more capable than, and more favored by God than women. When I was 13, I went to the local mosque in my neighborhood. They said that I couldn't come there and that I couldn't pray there. I often questioned how and why the men in my community had opportunities to have their views expressed while mine was suppressed. Even though not written in the Quran, many religious leaders in my faith and in other faith communities are caught up in this mindset. Single, narrow, ideological perspectives have blinded critical thinking. This destructive and discriminative mindset has created hierarchical structures, not only in my faith communities, but in all major faith communities. This mindset has led to the multi-layered discrimination, oppression, domination, and violence against women. Religious actors see gender equality as an ideology that threatens religious norms. Often, freedom of religion and belief are used as a justification to discriminate against women. The discrimination of women in the religious sphere is subtle, it's complex, and it's often hidden. My work takes me to the margins where we live, listen, and learn from the women in the margins. Often, I have felt like a physician trying to resuscitate a paralyzed organ. In our faith interactions, in interfaith interactions, we have failed to raise the issue of dignity and human rights for women of faith. We have instead bargained for comfort and moral complacency. It took me years to speak up. It was a revolutionary act because freedom of religion and belief always trumped gender discrimination. Even though I am privileged to speak, millions of my sisters of faith do not have that luxury. I say to them, be bold. Sometimes we must rely on someone else's faith in us until our faith kicks in. I wouldn't stand here if it wasn't for one man who believed in my story and my struggle. And he is Dr. Reverend Shanta Prema Vardhana, who heads the Omnia Institute for Contextual Leadership. At Omnia, we build interfaith peacemaker teams. We deconstruct received theologies and we dismantle supremacies. Dear friends, we must begin to look at our scripture as it is applied to marginalized women in our communities. Harmful practices such as female genital mutilation, forced marriage, child marriage, sexual violence, honor killings, denying women education and the freedom to work are often overlooked. These practices continue even though not written in our divine scriptures. As a consequence, women are emotionally scarred. I often think the most richest place on earth is where women of faith are buried, buried with all their gifts, their talents, and their abilities unused and unrecognized. In the name of religion, one in four girls are married off as child brides. In Nigeria, in Northeast Nigeria, polygamy is rampant and thriving. Women put up with this emotional horror due to economic necessity. Honor killings claim over 1,000 lives a year in Pakistan. While blasphemy laws have targeted Christian minority women like Asia Bibi, who served 10 years in a jail and today she has sought refuge in Canada. Today, I am the voice for over 3,000 Buddhist bhikkhunis in Sri Lanka. On their behalf, I have filed a petition at the International Religious Freedom Roundtable. Though these bhikkhunis have taken the same monastic vows as their male counterparts, they are being denied a national identity card with their religious designation. Even as I speak here today, certain religious actors in my community are determining and demanding that child marriage and polygamy be legalized. They have claimed that women are not fit to be judges. Changing the status quo and not prolonging it is our collective work. 
We must call out the abuse of our theologies. Religious dogma cannot replace human rights. I believe it that settles it is an old bumper sticker. I raise my voice, not because I have permission to do so, but because I don't have the luxury to say silent anymore. Centuries old functional distinctions imposed on women have become religious laws. Religious actors and scholars alike have failed, have failed to grasp contextual realities in patriarchal societies. Working in the margins, I know every day that when faith-based leadership and scholarship for women are strengthened and uplifted, the world will choose peace, not war, love, not hate, collaboration, not competition. My friends, our good is not our best. Most of our theological interpretations are frozen in the dungeons of orthodoxy. We have a notion of God so deluded by doctrine. If we truly want to foster the engagement of religious and spiritual communities to address the critical issues of our times, we must empower women, particularly those women of faith in the margins. To my sisters, the women in the margins, I say to you, don't be powerless. Build your community of like-minded women and men. Continue to take action, celebrate small victories and stay committed. Today, I ask you to commit to four things, my friends. Patriarchy is legitimized by religion. Mentor a girl on how to stand up to patriarchy. Help them reach their full potential. Develop initiatives to support and empower women and girls. I also ask you to call out countries where legal systems are based on religious norms and traditions, where women are consistently disadvantaged because of their gender. I ask of you to democratize and legitimize the voices of women who are standing up to and challenging patriarchy and superiority. Promote theological interpretation and reflection of women who have been historically denied and excluded from the interpretation of sacred text. I ask you, internalize and be cognizant of the suffering of women of faith and enable and provide resources and capacity building for women of faith, particularly those in the margins. We need a religious revolution, my friends. In the words of Robert F. Kennedy, few men are willing to brave the disapproval of their peers, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is rarer commodity than bravery in battle or intelligence. Yet it is one essential vital quality for those who seek to change the world that yields most painfully to change. We need a religious revolution. Thank you.